Good morning. My name is May Cannon. I'm the Executive Director of Churches for Middle East Peace, and we're here with NIMI, the Network of Evangelicals for the Middle East. I have the great privilege of being ordained in an evangelical denomination, of whom a representative is here with us today, Jeff Anderson. And the conversation we're having this morning is Voting Faithfully, How Evangelicals Shape Foreign Policy in the Middle East. And we have two special guests joining us from the Middle East, Najla Kassab, joining us from Lebanon, and Botrus Mansour, joining us from Nazareth in Israel. I'll introduce each of the panelists, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion. And if there are participants, um, you can feel free to ask questions online. I know many of you will look at this conversation afterward, but we thought it's a strategic time for us to be discussing this, as so many Americans are going to the polls uh, and voting for the November 3rd election. But let me introduce our panelists, and we'll start uh, with Reverend Najla Kassab, uh, who is the president of the World Communion for Reformed Churches and the director of the Christian Education Department for the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon. She has a BA from NEST, the Near East School of Theology, and a Master's of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary. Um, in 1993, Reverend Kassab received the first preaching license offered to a woman by the Near East um, the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon. Um, there's many, many credentials I could go on to continue, uh, but Najla is joining us from uh, Beirut, the Beirut area of Lebanon, and she lives with her husband, Joseph Kassab, and their three children. Um, and her work traditionally uh, takes her frequently to Syria. So good to have you with us. Yeah. Uh, welcome, Najla. Tell us, as we, we enter into this conversation about evangelicals and, you know, this big, big U.S. election that we have coming up, what are the realities that people need to know about in terms of Lebanon? What's happening in this particular moment? Thank you, May. And it's so good to join people, to, whether they are in the morning or in the afternoon. It's five o'clock in the afternoon here in Beirut. Uh, really, we live in a very special reality. Uh, now in Lebanon. We live in a very difficult economic crisis. And if I want to describe the economic situation in Lebanon, we are on the verge of collapse, which was due to decades of government corruption and financial mismanagement. Lebanon has the third biggest debt in the world after Japan and Greece. The Lebanese pound, for example, dropped 80% of its value since last October. Inflation is expected to reach 125% by the end of 2020. Banks are practicing strict capital control on people deposits, limiting them to withdraw minimum level of money. You, you don't have free access to your accounts in Lebanon now, uh, whether it's in the Lebanese pound or it's in, in uh, a foreign currency. Transferring currency overseas is no more an option. Even if you have a son or daughter who's studying overseas, you, you can, it's very hard to transfer money so that they continue their education. They have done some, nego done some negotiations just to help people continue their life uh, overseas. According to the World Bank today, 55% of the Lebanese live under the poverty line. Unemployment rate reached 40%. And many of the Lebanese who kept their jobs are receiving 50% of their salaries. For example, as a church, you know, uh, we work between Lebanon and Syria. We have schools and we have around 800 employed people in our schools. Since March, they have been receiving half a salary at a time where prices went very high. And this is the reality of many people in Lebanon who are still having salaries. The central bank in Lebanon claimed that after three months from now, uh, the government will not be able to provide subsidy for basic ingredients like wheat, medicine, 
and fuel. And the people are very concerned about the coming days in Lebanon where people cannot have bread on their table or they cannot have their medicine and fuel in a, in a winter that will be coming soon. You know, this is, what, this is the regular, what's added to this is what happened on, on August the 4th in the last blast uh, in Beirut where 300,000 people became homeless, 6,500 injuries, and 200 people were dead. Unfortunately, the area happened in the place where we keep our wheat. So we have lost uh, lots of our grain stored uh, that we have preserved for the country. This is why we are afraid about the future, how we will provide people with basics to be able to eat. Also the port that was a major uh, trade area was uh, affected. The damage that happened to the port area is costs around 15,000 billion US dollars, 15,000 billions. This is the last uh, crash that the explosion that happened in Beirut. You know, in, in response to this, we are stuck with difficult economy, the explosion, uh, you know, the effect of the explosion on people's lives. Uh, and the only solution that is seen now uh, is going to the IMF, International Monetary Fund. Unfortunately, till now, there is no agreement about, around this, uh, mainly because of the polarization that happens between the different groups in Lebanon and the sectarian political groups. And at the same time, due to the requirements that the IMF is, asks for before they can help. We cannot also forget the COVID-19 and its impact on people's life and economy. And unfortunately, when the explosion happened, four important hospitals in the Beirut area were damaged. And many of the coronavirus patients died out of that explosion. So uh, the medical services were affected. Also, we have no cabinet at this time. And uh, we, are, we hope that in the coming days, a cabinet will be formed to help the country to face the crisis and move forward. Last, the international community is practicing pressure on Lebanon, economic pressure, mainly that um, there will be no financial help unless Hezbollah is disarmed and the Iranian influ influence come to an end. Uh, what, what did this lead to? This led that many Lebanese who have other nationalities are leaving the country unfortunately. Huh. Doctors, and this is a very difficult situation where very equipped doctors who cannot wait to have jobs till after the hospitals are fixed, are leaving the country. At a time that Lebanon was known as the hospital of the Middle East, huh. uh, we, are, we have many of our doctors are leaving. We started to hear of boats of death, where the Lebanese are fleeing through boats, trying to escape the economic situation and what's happening in Lebanon. And they are going to Europe or any other parts of the world. It's the same story of the Syrians. And I'm so sad that the Lebanese had to go through the same strategy of forced to leave. And some of them are starting to die in the ocean. One big issue now is trust in leadership. And I believe it's always easy to build a house, but to build a trust is what we are lo losing here in Lebanon. And I want to say we have wonderful, uh, equipped young generation who one year ago were on the streets challenging accountability in this government. But unfortunately, till now, they could not do any change. 
uh, the, re the revolution on the street with the young people from different uh, uh, religions, different churches, were on the street asking for the dignity of the people. And this was a sign of hope. But today, with all this happening, there is discouragement because really they could not move forward in, in doing change in Lebanon. I want to say briefly, the hungry people are around us now, in our churches, in our neighbors, and it, it has changed very fast where we discovered as Christians, we have a role in feeding the people. Hmm in making a difference, in showing the love of Christ practically. Uh, last week, I was in a meeting with Rome. I could not attend it uh, physically, but uh, I, I attended virtually. And one person said, we have enough ideologies. It's time for practices. And I believe we are challenged as Christians to live our faith. And uh, at this time, it's important to pray with people, but it's not enough. And we I want us to feed them. We to... need to, to really uh, share our food with them. And yes. this is becoming a reality uh, in our neighborhood. I want, uh, uh, for sure, we will have some more time to talk about it. Uh, I want to say that as a church, we are challenged to be the church. Uh, that what, the, what I uh, mentioned uh, shows despair. But I want to say, as a church, we are a deeper church today than before. Hmm. We are challenged to live what we talk about. We are challenged to be uh, standing with the people, no matter who they are, and really to show, share our food uh, with them. How to keep the hope? is a big question for all of us and for the young people. Because, you know, I, I spend most of my time preaching, but I'm challenged with the young people that they want to see something practical happening in their life. We have, we, we do lots of this encouragement through our schools. I will be talking more about it. Uh, but I've lived in war all my life. I want to say these are one of the most difficult days that we are facing as mm. a country. We love our country, but we don't know where to start with change. Mm. We love the Middle East, but we, we see how we can really be practical about uh, impacting yes. uh, the, the society where we are living. Yeah. Uh, these are difficult days. Uh, we're afraid of the future because when people become hungry, they tend to accept anything. Hmm. And that scares me. Mm -hmm. they, they accept without, uh, they give up their values sometimes mm -hmm. because they are hungry. And I'm afraid we are pushed into this direction so that, uh, you know, we end up just agreeing because we feel we are weak and discouraged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Reverend Najla. And as we continue our conversation, I want to talk about how US policy perpetuates some of the realities that you're talking about in Lebanon and how this election will affect your people. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, I want us to talk about that more. And we'll also talk about things that the church can do constructively to respond. As you were talking, I just was thinking of Jesus's words when he said, what good is it if someone comes to you and they're thirsty and you tell them go and be well and do not give them something to drink. And I hear you saying the Lebanese people are thirsty and hungry. And so by God's grace, may we come alongside of you in prayer, but not only in prayer as we seek to respond. So Botris, thank you for joining us. I know that there's a, a time difference as winter approaches uh, between Jerusalem and, um, you know, I'm on the West Coast, so it's bright and early morning for me where I'm located. Uh, but let me introduce those who are watching to Botris Monsour based in Nazareth. I don't know that I knew that you were a lawyer, Botris, um, but he has represented clients all around the country from different backgrounds and nationalities. He leads the only K through 12 evangelical school recognized in Israel while co-founding and serving as an elder with the pastoral roles 
in Baptist church, uh, in a Baptist church in Nazareth. Botris has been involved in Christian ministries, including heading the Convention for Evangelical Churches in Israel, co-funding Nazareth Village, and membership in the Executive Committee of the Secretariat of Christian Schools in Israel, to name a few. Um, he's also been writing and giving lectures in Arabic, Hebrew, and English all around the world about matters of faith and life in the Middle East. And I had the privilege of reading a, a recent book that he's working on that'll be coming out soon. Uh, so congratulations in that regard, uh, Botris. We're grateful to have you with us. And the, the hats that you wear just in your identity, being a citizen of Israel, being in Nazareth as a Palestinian Christian evangelical, tell us what we we need to know about the worlds that you uh, live in and where you minister. Okay, thank you for this opportunity to share uh, my heart and to share, uh, especially in the context of uh, coming American elections. Um, of course, I live in Nazareth, of course, which is uh, the largest Arab uh, town in Israel proper. Uh, lots of people, first of all, don't know that they're Arab Christians in the first place. So, of course, if we uh, point them back to Acts uh, chapter 2, uh, the day of Pentecost, there were Arabs there that accepted uh, Jesus and became his followers. And we know from history from the first century that uh, there were Arab Christians uh, uh, there, uh, like in Lebanon, in Egypt, in Palestine, and so on. And now, secondly, that's one point only. The other thing people do not know about Palestinians. Uh, um, we hear a lot in the news about the West Bank and Gaza, a two-state solution, uh, Arafat, Abbas today, and so on. So that group of people under the Israeli occupation from 1967 are well-known. Ramallah, Bethlehem, Hebron, these places are under Israeli military rule. And of course, there are the Palestinians that in 1948 were scattered all around the world, had to, were dragged out by the Jewish uh, uh, troops at that time and had to leave the country to Lebanon and to Jordan to other places and of course to the West uh, later on. But there is the third group that I belong to, which are the Palestinians who for different reasons uh, stayed where they were and for a long time were considered, uh, considered by both Arabs outside Israel, outside Palestine as traitors and by the Jewish uh, establishment in Israel as also traitors. What's this very peculiar, strange group of people called Palestinians who became out of the blue after the war in 1948, became Israeli citizens as well. So I am an Israeli on the one hand, I have an Israeli citizenship, an Israeli passport, and I vote for the Knesset and so on and so on. Of course, marginalized and with lots of problems, second class citizen and so on, but an Israeli citizen at the end of the day. But I'm at the same time also a Palestinian. I'm part of the Palestinian people. For example, Nazareth, the hometown of Jesus, where I live, the Jewish troops came in 1948. And uh, I think there was some influence to the fact that uh, Nazareth is the hometown of Jesus, and they did not want to have uh, a, a war, a struggle, or a conflict, an armed conflict between them and the local Arab. Uh, citizens at that time. So uh, they reached some kind of agreement and uh, there was no blood, did not need to leave. Uh, they were not, uh, there was no need for them to leave, uh, to leave Nazareth. And like them in 1948, the number were, were 150,000 people total. Today, the number of about 2 million, 2 million people. About 85% of them are Muslims, and about 8 9% of them are uh, Christian Palestinians living in Israel, uh, something like 130,000 people. And there is also a small uh, community, almost the same number like the uh, Christians, Druze and Christians, almost the same number. So we are a minority in a minority in a minority. People you know, when I travel abroad, I they ask me, where do you come from? I say, you know, I come from Nazareth. Where, where is Na Nazareth? Israel also, oh, you're Jewish. No, actually, I'm not Jewish. I'm Arab. I'm Arab, so you're Muslim. No, sorry. Sorry, again, I'm not Muslim. I'm Christian. 
And then, of course, they will think about the main uh, large uh, Christian communities in uh, the Holy Land, which are the Catholics, the Greek Orthodox, and so on. But I'm also not part of them. I'm from a small group called the Baptist Church and part of the large, a little bit larger, which is the Evangelicals. Our total number in Israel is uh, 5,000 people, Evangelicals. Uh, evangelical Palestinian Christians in Israel are 5,000 people. Um, there are, of course, Anglicans we have here. Uh, also, they are almost the same number, maybe three, 4,000 also. So we're a very small minority in a minority in a minority. And uh, our layers of identities also contradict one with another. On the one hand, I'm Israeli, and I'm expected by the government here to be loyal and so on. I am not anti-Israel as such, but I'm anti the government uh, decisions and the government policies, which are uh, very harmful, not only for the Palestinians, but I, be I believe also for the Jewish people themselves. So I'm Israeli on the one hand, and then I'm Palestinian. When God forbid, but unfortunately we have that every few years, there is some kind of uh, war raids, um, air raids or uh, between Israel and the Gaza Strip or uh, Antifada or something with Lebanon and so on. So you are sort of between both and your heart is with the people who are suffering, but at the same time you have an affiliation with it. So all these uh, um, sub-identities, I call them, uh, contradict one with another. Add to it, of course, and maybe we're gonna talk about that uh, maybe later, but uh, being a, an evangelical, if you say evangelical today, people will say, oh, evangelical American, that's almost equals Trump supporter. Uh oh, this is not uh, who, I'm, who, who I am at all. Uh, so I'm evangelical, I believe in the Bible, I believe in Jesus, I believe in being born again, and the need that, to, for every person to be dedicated to Jesus and to be a, a true follower of Jesus. But at the same time, I am not, I don't endorse um, um, conservative, not necessarily all the cons conservative uh, policies, and pro-Israeli and so on, which also create a big problem for me. So this is a little bit about, you know, all the complexities that uh, we live in here, around here, in identity, but they are rooted in the history and who we are and how we live uh, these days. Thank you, Botrus. And I, I think some of the things that you articulated about those tensions we experience in different ways. You know, the organization I lead, Churches for Middle East Peace, is based in Washington, D.C. And I'm an evangelical and also a woman. And so that sometimes for some people as a pastor in an evangelical denomination uh, causes some confusion. Uh, in, in terms of those complex identities. In that regard, I have the privilege of introducing our final panelist today, Jeff Anderson, who is uh, one of the executive leaders in the denomination that I'm ordained in, of which I'm very proud, Jeff. Uh, Jeff uh, works with the Serve Globally as the co-regional coordinator with his wife, Darlene, of the Middle East for the Evangelical Covenant Church. Uh, MENA, I believe, Middle East and North Africa. Is that right, Jeff? Um, right. Prior to his current work, he served as the president superintendent of the Evangelical Covenant Church of Canada for 19 years. His connection with the MENA region started when he and a small group of Canadian denominational leaders joined key World Vision Canada leadership to spend a week of listening to residents of Palestine, the West Bank, and Arab Christians in the Galilee area. Jeff has led multiple groups of leaders in the region with an emphasis on listening to the people who live in the region, along with enjoying typical holy sites and tour sites. A key part of the role of um, the regional coordinator is to help the church in Canada and the United States understand and appreciate the part of the world that gave rise to our Christian faith. Um, and in that regard, Jeff, I think I might have met you uh, for one of the first times on one of those World Vision trips uh, in the West Bank. Uh, and today I really wanted Jeff to be with us to talk about the work of an evangelical denomination in the United States, but specifically they have a campaign responding to some of the needs that are happening in Yemen. And so as you were talking about the humanitarian crisis increasingly facing Lebanon, Najla, I heard on the news this morning that uh, malnutrition has reached an all-time high 
Shanghai in Yemen. Uh, and so Jeff, tell us a bit about your work uh, with the Evangelical Covenant, but your work in Yemen specifically and, and, and what you're paying attention to in terms of the Middle East. Sure. Well, first of all, I just think it's so great to have uh, guests and uh, people that can help us understand because uh, my, my, from the people I talk to in the United States and Canada, most of us just don't know. It's just off the radar. I mean, the Beirut explosion is a great illustration. It was only on the news cycle for about three days and it was a horrific event, but it was just gone. Uh, in the midst of the election and everything else. Um, Yemen hardly even makes, I mean, go to your favorite news site and, and just put in the word Yemen and see if how many times over a year it even comes up. Um, so this is the worst humanitarian crisis in the world for three years running. And most of the people I talked to had no idea that that was the case. Um, you know, Yemen is about 30 million people. 80% of that population is in need of some kind of humanitarian aid. I mean, just, just think about our own neighborhoods, like 80% of the people around us need some kind of aid. 20 million need food assistance. Half of those are, have acute food insecurity, which means they really have no idea where their next, um, meal is coming from. But the real tragedy in terms of malnutrition, uh, of all children, there's 2 million children uh, with malnutrition, 500,000 under the age of five with acute, which means, you know, you're talking about things like um, uh, brain damage, like long-term damage, not just I'm hungry, I missed a meal, long-term life damage. And so, um, it, it's in the context of that. It's in the context of a war uh, that's been going on, you know, for a long, since 2014, before that, you know, in the Arab Spring, there was a change of government. 2015, the Saudis and a coalition got involved. Um, and so this war has been going on. And, uh, and so you've got the war, you've got famine, you've got um, a few years back, there was a huge cholera outbreak and now COVID. And um, I know one uh, area, my wife was telling me about an article where in one area for the entire area, I think they had 15 ICU beds. So, you know, you can just imagine people just aren't um, uh, getting treated. And so in the middle of that, you know, we just said, well, the need is so huge. And I think a lot of times in the West, we become overwhelmed. Um, you, you know, whether it's um, the Beirut explosion, you know, the outpouring just wasn't there. Um, and I think sometimes it's because people just get overwhelmed, like what can we do? And so we just found a partner and they put together large food packs that will feed a family of seven for a month. And, you know, we did a one day social media thing and it looks like, you know, maybe we're gonna, the little thing we did is going to feed, uh, you know, a hundred families for a full month. They're going to get, uh, you know, like um, uh, 50 kilograms of flour. So the, not just a little bag, but actually enough to feed a family for a month. And, and there's two ways to look that one is out of, you know, out of 24 million people that need help, like what's a hundred, what, what's 600 people maybe, or 700 people. But it's 700 people. And so I, I think that's the call is, um, you know, the scriptures are very clear. We, we're not accountable for what we don't have. We're accountable for what we do have. And so I think that's been our approach is what are the small things that we can do? You know, in Lebanon, a small thing we did was um, there was a place that was creating some space for homeless in Lebanon. So you know, we were able to spend, send a small amount. So that's, that's kind of our approach. Thank you, Jeff. And um, part of the work we've been doing at Churches for Middle East Peace as it relates to Yemen, uh, I don't know if you know, the, 
some of the only bipartisan legislation that has been passed in Washington, D.C. under the Trump administration was legislation on Yemen, where Republicans and Democrats came together and said that the U.S. intervention has to stop because the U.S. had been fueling Saudi planes and supporting the Saudi coalition, which was further perpetuating uh, this war in Yemen. And so the legislation passed and then it ended up being um, vetoed by President Trump. Um, so some of what I want us to talk about now is, you know, the title of our conversation is Voting Faithfully. And so uh, in that regard, the role that each of us play as citizens in our society, uh, in the United States, we have you know, the privilege and opportunity to vote in the upcoming presidential election. Many people have voted already, but the subtitle of our conversation is how evangelicals shape U.S. foreign policy. And what would be really helpful, I mean, you mentioned this, Botris, as being an evangelical and how that's increasingly in the U.S. context being associated with President Trump in this current administration. So maybe we'll start with you. How do you see evangelicals shaping U.S. foreign policy? And how does that affect realities for you living in Israel and also as a Palestinian? Of course, it's no secret that Israel and the U.S. have a long time um, strategic relationship, very close. And um, for a long time, uh, the U.S. pretended it was a fair uh, broker between Israel and the Palestinians. There were a few attempts during the years, you know, Camp David, maybe the first Camp David, to, to reach a, a resolution. Um, of course, the reasons for that are vast, of course, political, strategic, uh, the Jewish lobby in America, APAC, and so on and so on, what they claim they call Judeo-Christian Judeo values, shared Judeo-Christian values. Um, I won't comment on each one of those, but I'm just say, stating the facts. So this was the case the whole time. What happened uh, the la last elections, 2016, was that added to that came into uh, like a religious factor, if I want to call it like that, a biblical, religious, some kind of uh, uh, flavor, religious flavor of. Uh, a cynical politician face, in my opinion. I'm not judging, but of his deeds, we can see that. But uh, he found a great opportunity, a great niche, which is the evangelical Christians who are something like 25% of the constituency in America. And he found a way to get them closer to him. So he adopted all the hot issues uh, that are important for them. Of course, uh, high court uh, nominees, uh, um, uh, gay people, uh, abortion issues. So he took all these issues and as if he played, as if he, uh, he was, uh, he took all those stands that he was going to promote them. And as a result, 81% or whatever of white evangelicals uh, supported him uh, the last time and they became up till today, the most uh, uh, supportive people of uh, Trump. In addition to all these issues, uh, one of the big issues was Israel. Uh, as I said before, Israel has always uh, accepted great favor from America's uh, policies, but this time it was even over. It was also, they, they stopped the pretendants. You know, they were not just pretending that they were fair, but this time, for the first time illegally against international law, um, America moved its embassy to Jerusalem, which is uh, the eastern part is occupied land 1967, as well as accepted the recognition of the Golan Heights as part of Israel, which is also occupied land. So they took it over and this uh, joke called uh, the deal of the century. Also, the, the, the Trump, uh, administration presented was really humiliating to the Palestinians, just uh, shattering any type of hope for the Palestinians. And now in recent days, you know, trying to bypass the Palestinian issue by reaching agreements with the uh, Arab countries that for a long time were, were not uh, normalizing any kind of relationships with Israel, although 
in lots of cases, there was no real confrontation between these countries and Israel, but at least they were asking that the Palestinian matter be resolved first, and then a comprehensive peace in the Middle East. So unfortunately, um, the evangelical Christians in, uh, in America, the, the very negative um, impact on uh, the American policy towards the Palestinians in general, and among them, uh, Palestinian Christians. And uh, we feel that, in, that there is almost, almost no hope for uh, people to reach some kind of uh, peaceful uh, resolution. Israel continues to build settlements. Uh, they wanted to annex annexation of the, the, the whole West Bank and then in the last minute sort of delayed that in the meantime. So um, it's, uh, it's very negative. And this is not an internal American issue. I might tell you, you know what? I accept some of the domestic uh, policies that the uh, current uh, administration in America holds social issues and, and I'm a conservative so, socially and so on, but all the rest and that are, uh, are very damaging to the uh, Palestinian Christians uh, living here. So um, that's where we stand. Unfortunately, I hope I was more optimistic. Of course, being uh, a Christian a believer in Jesus uh, gives me hope still. I, I know that the Lord can appear in the last minute, just before the, the dawning of, of the day and in a miraculous way also change things. And I pray that he does because there is a need for peace. The thing is, a lot of these Christians in America have uh, put eschatology or a certain type of uh, interpretation of eschatology or last days in front and before any kind of other teachings that Jesus has been talked about in the Sermon on the Mount or in the middle, in the center, as if that was the whole thing and that was the most important thing. So uh, I pray this changes uh, in the coming elections. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Botrus. And I think, you know, one of the points I heard you just articulate that I really want listeners to know, I learned this when I lived in Jerusalem in 2010 and 2011. I think that people living in the Middle East pay as much attention to US elections, if not more attention to US elections than those of us who live here in the United States. And so that's why I thought this conversation was so important to hear. How is it going to impact you? You know, if there's continued policies in the way that they've been um, you know, promoting things like annexation of the Golan Heights or, you know, the proposed annexation of parts of the West Bank. How does that affect you? So thank you. That's very helpful. Najla, same question to you. Yes. U.S. politics affect your realities. So how so? What do we need to know as we go into the elections, particularly about how evangelicals shape U.S. policy and what that means for your life and for the lives of others in Lebanon? Yes. Uh, you know, the issue of voting is important to us as Lebanese, not with, uh, you know, in, now we have this PD move to have a cabinet in Lebanon. And we think this is happening because of the elections in the US. Because some people might think if change happens, what would happen to their relations? Yes, it impacts us. And I believe as a Christian, even as a Lebanese, we are teaching our young people how to vote. Because we live in a country where we have corruption. We are afraid that people, if they were to go back to vote in Lebanon, they might vote for the same leaders because they are not aware of the reality of how to vote and how to choose people, not under slogans, but under real values. This is why I believe an evangelical should go and vote, number one. As a church, we should not be isolated. We should believe that we should be involved politically. Number two, you know, politicians have agendas. They, don't, they are not our pastors, you know? They have agendas, and this is why we should not confuse this. And I'm raised with, the, you know, in Lebanon, we are raised as children to hear uh, politics every day. Uh, and I think in the Middle East, is part of who we are. So we, we need to learn to read between the lines. 
that presidents have agendas and countries have agendas. How we will choose? We will choose people who reflect the values of the Bible. And when they don't do well, we have to hold them accountable that what you're saying does not reflect the core message of the Bible. And this is where the church should be involved, should not be submissive, but should be alert to challenge leadership. And this is what I'm working in Lebanon with the young generation. You know, to be in the line of evangelicals or reform is to be to stand for accountability. We are raised in churches where every one of us is held accountable. How to make sure that the person we're voting to really shows the values of the Bible, of reconciliation, of loving others, of believing that an American child is as valuable as a Lebanese child or as a child in the Middle East. These are a human-centered president, you know? That's very important. To us in the Middle East, we were born in, in war, and I am afraid we will die in war. Enough for a, an area where peace is, has, is far away. And what we see now, you know, we love peace. We want peace to happen, but we want justice to happen. We want justice for the Palestinians. It cannot be that peace is signed with everybody without the Palestinians on that. You know, this is where we need people who will speak the same language before the election and after the election. Because many people, you know, from our politicians in Lebanon, we know they sell nice words. They know how to, uh, to impact us through the media, but how to have people who, have, who care about humanity. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. We should always be this voice when people have no dignity in their daily life. The church should stay, whether evangelicals, anybody who knows Christ. We are called to say, to point to areas where there is degradation for humanity, where people don't have dignity in the way they, lie, they live. And this is where I was so happy to hear from Jeff, their involvement in Yemen. You know, every child who suffers around the world is a child of God and we have to be involved. So this is how we vote. We should be have our eyes open as churches. We need to hear the news is, uh, you know, hijacked by political agendas. <laughs> this is why this time of sharing is valuable to hear something else than the regular news uh, that we hear. Sometimes we hear uh, uh, news from one side that's politicized. And it's time to hear the news from the other side of the globe. Yes, the elections will affect us. We hope uh, the, the next president would care for the dignity of the Middle East. A Palestinian told me, uh, you know, lately that it's, it looks like there are business deals called peace. And I'm afraid this is not real peace. We need peace with justice, where people live with dignity and every person is valuable. Uh, I believe that uh, we need, uh, I know the challenges that the people in the US are facing today, you know, uh, and it is time to have peace from within also in the US with the divisions, with the, uh, you know, uh, the movement with the Black Lives Matters around this. Uh, I cannot breathe. We all feel like we cannot breathe at some times, you know. And this is a time where the gospel challenges us about how do we live the gospel in our life. You know, as a person I work, I have learned to see my faith related to justice. Many times, as, as people in the church, we think to do justice work is not spiritual. And to be spiritual is to work within the church, the regular salvation of the people, which is very important, but to move beyond the walls of the church and help the people, I think this is the challenge of how we live our faith. So 
An act of voting is an act of living our faith, of seeking justice outside the walls of the church. Uh, we pray for what will happen. We pray that God would, uh, you know, uh, change the mentality where people would care about every child. We pray that the coming president would care about our economic situation in Lebanon. We care that, you know, the coming president will not fight Iran in Lebanon. We care that the coming president will care that we don't want to lose Christians in this part of the world where people are leaving. We don't want the Middle East with no Christians. And if I were a president who cares about the gospel, I should care about the witness of the Christians in the Middle East. Uh, this, is, this is cannot happen without us being actively voting uh, and believing that the church can make a difference. Many times we feel like, oh, it's not our area politics. We are, we have to, be, we are called to be involved and we have to trust that Christ, the, the Holy Spirit will use us to change the Middle East and to change the world in that. So uh, the friends who are hearing us, we are agents of change. And the moment we are silent on injustice, as a church, we lead to more injustice. Thank you, Najla. Um, as you talked about uh, opening our eyes, you know, may we go to the voting booth with our eyes opened. My hope is that this is one uh, small example of exposing people to some of the realities that we might not know about the way U.S. policies affect realities in the Middle East. I remember living um, when I was in the Middle East during the Arab Spring, The Economist magazine or one of the big magazines, it might have been Newsweek or something, had a picture of an Egyptian uh, screaming on the cover. And it really, really, really upset me because in Egypt, so many aspects of the Arab Spring were beautiful. You had Muslims and Christians coming together and all the U.S. saw was an angry Arab, right? And, and I just thought, uh, I want you to meet the Arab mothers who have fed me so much. I mean, I put on so much weight living in the Middle East because of Palestinian mothers, you know, saying hutti hutti and uh, eat more, eat more. And the hospitality and the beauty of, and the diversity of people throughout the Middle East. So thank you, Najla. Jeff, um, you're on the front lines in terms of, you know, as we go to the polls and uh, intersecting with evangelicals in the U.S. and also in Canada. Um, as you think about the question of how do evangelicals shape U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, what do you most want people to know? Okay, a couple things. Number one, and uh, as has been said, this is great. We really need to be educated more about it because I think a lot of times as followers of Jesus, we get so enwrapped in what's going on in our backyard. And so again, back to Yemen, you know, um, this is not just a Trump policy, actually uh, going back to the Obama administration, they also supported the Saudi invasion um, and the bombings that the Saudis do, you know, um, the majority of them, two thirds of the bombings are civilian targets. And a lot of that is our American arms that is doing that, right? And so are, do we know about that? Um, you know, 2017, it, it went into steroids with the huge sale of arms by the Trump administration. So, you know, whichever party you are going to end up voting for, I look at it like family, like we've got to be educated. If they're really our family, if we really care, then we have the right to speak out. And that's the by um, the, the legislation you were talking about was both Republicans and Democrats. You know, what if more evangelicals would have written in, you know, what would have happened? Um, maybe, maybe it wouldn't be vetoed, who knows? Um, so I think we need to be uh, way more informed about things. We need to pray about things. We need to realize that, you know, these are places that are part of our scriptures. You know, anybody who's gone to church has heard about the cedars of Lebanon. So let's take that image and let's, let's get it into, as we were called, the people side. Um, I'm pretty sure we've heard of Nazareth. 
But we've also heard of Yemen. Uh, that is ancient Sheba, the, that great text in 1 Kings 10 about the Queen of Sheba going. And so this is a country with a glorious history of part of our biblical story, and we should care. Um, but fundamentally, we should care about the people. We need to pray. Um, that is a big thing we can do. And then the last thing is just, I wanna reinforce what was said. Our voting should not be going into the booth and you know whatever method they use there. I love it in Canada, it's one little X on a little sheet of paper and you fold it up. Uh, it, way more elaborate in the US, I know that. Uh, but um, voting needs to go on until the next election. We, we vote with our actions and followers of Jesus have to be active in speaking to values that are biblical values that transcend whatever party we end up voting for. Yella. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. We've had several questions coming in. Thank you, Botris, for responding to them um, online. There was one more for you. And I'm sensitive our time has really just seem, seemingly disappeared. Um, there was a question for you, Botris, about how are evangelicals in the Holy Land able to separate themselves from Christian Zionists? I don't know if you feel like you can tackle that in a minute or two uh, before we come to a close. Uh, it's not easy because, uh, as you can imagine, uh, Israel, the Holy Land, is a center uh, for lots of uh, evangelical Christians in general, or Zionists, if you want to call them, a part, large number of them are. And they come here, they visit here, they uh, um, visit the holy places and so on, as well as pour a lot of money to Israel as a government, as an establishment, as well as to different ministries and uh, organizations here in Israel. So if someone needs to be, you know, in ministry, in a local evangelical ministry, uh, it's very difficult to, as one person, small ministry, not very wealthy, not very resourceful, to stand against the whole Zionist agenda, Christian Zionist agenda. So that's a dilemma. What we try to do is on a small scale, uh, getting to know a lot of uh, these American Christians, a large number of them are lovely people. They love the Lord, but in my opinion, I've got it wrong concerning um, the last days as well as political agendas that affect us directly. But as they get to know people living here and get to know the culture, the Arabic, the Palestinian culture, get to know real people, real Palestinian Christian people, uh, some of them change uh, a little bit or modify their views and their attitude is uh, sort of uh, different. Sometimes it's very difficult because you're talking about theology and the theology that is so deep and so uh, uh, convincing for them, uh, sort of a conviction, their own conviction. So it's uh, sometimes more difficult, but the relationship is, is important. This is why we uh, encourage people who come to visit the country not to just come and visit the dead stones of the country and visit the holy places and the, and wherever you go in Israel or Palestine, you will find them all around, you know, these important uh, places that are important for our faith, but also to visit the living stones of the country. The, the remnant, you know, our percentage in Israel is 1.5% of the whole country. I was talking earlier about only the Arab community, we are about 8%, but it's 1.5%, a very small, uh, a group of uh, believers, Christian believers uh, in this country, and we encourage them to come and visit and come and see. Like uh, when uh, they, they, Philip was talking to his brother, Nathaniel, about Jesus, he said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> and that was, come and see. So we use that sort of uh, in the 21st century, we say, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, please come and see, come and visit us, come to get to know us and you'll understand us more, and you can pray better for us also. Mm. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, our time has come to an end. Reverend Najla, would you be willing to give us a closing benediction as we go? For sure. Almighty and gracious God, we thank you because you are, you are our Lord and you are our hope. We thank you because we are struck but not destroyed mm. because you are with us. We pray for the elections that will happen in the U.S. We pray for 
that you lead the people for all that is good in your eyes. We pray for every one of us, for our ministry, and we ask you to send us out to live your faith, a faith that Jesus Christ taught us as he lived on this earth. Give us strength, give, give us hope, and give us courage, because with you, with your Holy Spirit, we can make a difference. Bless us all. Amen. Amen. Thank you, each of you. I so appreciate you being with us. Thank you for this conversation and blessings to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Nice meeting you.